We are in a uh, series on the Minor Prophets, and I've been meaning to um, print, I'm going to turn this mic on, I've been meaning to print uh, some, some new sermon cards that let you guys know what sermons, what messages are coming up on what passages, so you guys can be reading ahead, and I'm just really out of that loop with, um, with COVID, but I'll give you a, a heads up, um, I'm out of town next week, Zach is preaching doing a three-part series that's going to be kind of scattered throughout the fall on joy. And the passage next week is? Romans 15, 13. So if we always encourage people, read ahead. Read so that your mind isn't first exposed to God's word when you show up here. How much easier can it be than that? You have one verse to read and prepare your hearts for Zach preaching next week. Uh, but also, so I'm very excited about that. I wish I could be here for that. I will be uh, listening at my first opportunity I can. Um, but we're in this series on the Minor Prophets, and you can turn with me to the book of Zechariah. It's the second to last. Maybe the easiest way to get there is you find that division between Old Testament and New Testament and flip back a couple pages. Um, so Zach will preach next week. I'll come back and preach Malachi, which is the last book of this series. But then we're going to launch in the fall. We're going to move into a series on the book of Acts. And I'll have that scheduled for you very uh, shortly. That will probably take us through the spring. And, and there will be some other things interspersed throughout there. Um, the book of Zechariah is quite a bit longer. than It is the longest of the minor prophets. Uh, so I am not going to read this one uh, this morning. I have been very judicious in reading passages. If at all possible, I thought I could convince you to stay with me for a few extra minutes. Uh, but Zechariah, I don't have that confidence. That might say more about me than you, but we're not going to read 14 chapters of Zechariah this morning. Um, but I but want you there because we will kind of bounce through the book a little bit. Um, and, and if you didn't read it going into this week, Read it this week when you go home. It's, it's, it's 14 chapters, but they're actually very short chapters. And, and check what I'm saying. Um, you know, we sometimes look at history, or at least I do, as sort of a succession of crises or, or battles, one after another. You know, this one happened, and then that thing happened, and, and then so on and so forth. And, and it tends to reduce historical time periods to like single major issues. So, you know, I confess, I think about American history like this. It feels like, you know, settlement, you know, Jamestown and, uh, you know, the pilgrims in, in Massachusetts, and then Revolutionary War, and then solidifying our independence in the War of 1812, and then slavery in the Civil War, and then manifest destiny in Western expansion, and then Prohibition, and then World War I, and then the Great Depression, and then World War II. And it's just kind of like this sequence of events in my mind. But truthfully, that's an oversimplification, right? Uh, if we were to describe America in 1776, we'd probably talk about the Revolutionary War and the Declaration of Independence. That's, that's what you would probably first go to if I talked about America in 1776. But if we described America in 2021, you'd probably talk about political divisions and, and pandemics and vaccines, the, the January 6th commission and, and massive heat waves and the GameStop stock craze and the new Martian rover and helicopter and Bill Cosby's conviction overturned and the Indians becoming the guardians. What will be the one thing that we whittle down this to in 100 years? That, you know, life on the ground is more complicated than sometimes the bird's eye view that we get from history. And I think something could be said about the Persian period of, of the pro Persian province of Judah in 520 BC. In the book of Ezra, at the top of the fifth chapter, we read, Now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Last week we talked about the book of Haggai, and this week we're going to turn our attention to the book of Zechariah. And, and you've got these two prophets who are prophesying at the same time in the same place. And while there is definitely some overlap in their messages, the prophecies are very different. Haggai focused on a God who reset the priorities of the world, even 
while he called his people to reset theirs. And Zechariah's message, well, it's a lot more diverse. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, like most of the minor prophets, we know very little about Zechariah, but Edo, it says he's the son of Bechariah, the son of Edo. He's called a son of Edo in the book of Ezra as well. Um, Edo and a descendant of his named Zechariah appear in the names of the list of priests that returned to Jerusalem with the governor Zerubbabel in the 12th chapter of Nehemiah. So it's likely that Zechariah was a priest, that he was of the priestly family. He's not a high priest, but he's a priest. I don't know why I have this up here. You know, if you, if you think the, the group of Jews that came to Jerusalem, that they, they did that in 539 B.C. And if you were here last week, I'm, I'm going to rehash a little bit of it, but I'm going to go over it a little bit faster. You, you might remember that in an oversimplified world history, the Assyrians arose and conquered what we know as the Middle East today. And, and they were replaced by the Babylonians who overran the Assyrians. And then a coalition of Medes and Persians rebelled and overthrew the Babylonians. And they formed what we call the Achaemenid Empire, or the Persian Empire. And if you look in the history books of this time period, the Jewish people are really just kind of a footnote to all this activity in our history textbooks. But the Persians were a little different than the Assyrians and the Babylonians who came before them. The Assyrians and Babylonians, they took the Israelites and the Judahites out of their homelands and settled them into new land, and they put new people from other places back into Israel and Judah. They had a kind of a strategic political uh, idea of let's just mix all the people up, and if you mix all the people up, then they kind of lose their separate identities, they don't rebel against you. It tends to make a smoother empire. Well, Persia's political philosophy was, hey, these people are happier if they're doing kind of their own thing under my rule. And being polytheists, as they probably were, they can all go back to their homelands and they can worship their gods and offer me prayer, offer prayers on my behalf. And if all the gods of the world are happy with me, then I'll be a more successful emperor. And so he sent Jews... Uh, that is, King Cyrus of Persia sent the Jews back to Judah to rebuild a temple. But they got weighed down with other concerns, and we learned last week how Haggai challenged them in that work. But Ezra also describes Zechariah as being helpful in motivating the people to rebuild the temple. Now, Zechariah's encouragement and challenges to the people was less direct than Haggai's. Much more than Haggai, Zechariah was kind of in the future tying the Jews' immediate desires and obligations to future realities that remained unseen. The descendants of Abraham and, and Isaac and Jacob, the Israelites, they had a long history of seeing themselves as God's chosen people, as being special. They were his blessing in the world and, and caretakers of the worship of the Most High God, Yahweh. But God had removed his hand of protection and sent them into captivity, first by the Assyrians, next by the Babylonians. And their status as God's people was very much in question. But Zechariah's message might be summed up this way. God will have a people and he will be king over the earth. God will have a people and he will will be king over all the earth. I think Zechariah's message has uh, four or five main parts, uh, which each feel very different from the other. But I think they work together to form a unified whole. And we'll take a look at each one of these four in turn. And there is a lot of meat here. And so I apologize up, uh, off the top. I had a hard time putting this one together because Zechariah is so long and there are so many diverse things going on there. And this is going to be a, a real overview. But I hope that that message comes through as we scan it. But it's really interesting that this first section, and, and it really this first section I think is just the first six verses. 
And it also kind of sets the stage for the book. We read this. It says, in the eighth month, I mean, it was chapter one, verse one. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Edo, saying, the Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore, say to them, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets cried out, thus says the Lord of hosts. Return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? Now, this prophecy came, we can date it because we know the reign of Darius. It, it came in October or maybe November of 520 B.C. And it's a call to repentance. Through the prophet, God reminds the people that their ancestors were warned to turn from their evil ways, but they refused to listen, and so they faced judgment. And with very different words, Zechariah seems to echo the words and thoughts of Isaiah, the great prophet from before all this disaster had struck. You know, Isaiah had, had once prophesied that all flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. God's word is eternal. It endures. It, it doesn't fade away like the flowers of the field. It, it doesn't wilt in the scorching summer heat like our lawns. But human beings, we do. Those ancient Israelites had stubbornly refused to submit to God, but they were destroyed and, and exiled. But God's word remained. Did they not overtake your fathers? Asks God through Zechariah. And the implicit threat is that if they don't repent, the same fate would happen to them. Maybe a point of interest, and I, and I wonder if there's a connection here, we're not told what they need to repent of. And in that way, it's very similar to the prophecy we saw in Haggai chapter 2, Last week, and, and if you look at the dates of the prophecies, that prophecy in Haggai chapter 2 takes place one month later, which really could have just been a few days later, depending on when in the month Zechariah gave this prophecy. And, and there we saw that God challenged the people that their religious devotion was impure and worthless because they themselves were impure. And yet we're never told exactly what the problem was. We're never told exactly what it was they were doing that was making them impure. But the bottom line was that they were unrepentantly sinful. And so all the things that they thought they were doing for God, all the holy things that they thought they were doing, all the things that they thought were religiously impressive, God saw those things as worthless. But like with Haggai, I don't think it matters in Zechariah what the exact sin was, because what we do know still matters. You know, I think it's the curse of every generation to think that it is doing much better than previous generations. It also happens to be the curse of every generation that it thinks that the ones coming after them are screwing everything up that they did right, but that's another sermon. And whether you're part of the silent generation or the baby boomers or Generation X or the millennials or Generation Z or like Silas and Duncan, your Generation Alpha, there's a tendency, or in their case will be a tendency, to think that you are different than the guys and gals who came before you. You're righteous. You guys have got it together. You learned from the past. The mistakes they made seem so obvious you wouldn't fall into that trap. But our own mistakes are so much harder to see than the mistakes of others, aren't they? It's so much easier 
to point the finger outward than to point the finger inward. And I think that works just as much for individuals as it does for generations. Because we don't think that we'll make the horrible decisions of the past generations, we think that we'll escape the consequences of those bad decisions that they made. But God doesn't judge with a historical filter. God doesn't judge 1933 and the rise of Nazism and fascism in Germany by the standards of 2021. And he doesn't judge the 2021 by the standards of 1821. And he didn't judge 586 B.C., the date that Jerusalem was sacked by Babylon, by the standards of 520 B.C., these returned exiles who maybe think they know better than their parents. God is God, and he judges all things by his uncompromising and unchanging standards. And so we are always liable to get it wrong. God doesn't look at what we're doing and think, that's the standard. They got it down. Everyone else is wrong. No, God's standard is God's heart. And that is the measuring line that we will be set against. But we read the people responded. So in, in verse, verse 6, we see it says, uh, so they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts proposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so has he dealt with us. They're basically acknowledging that what God said to the previous generation came true, and what God is saying now is true. God does as he purposes. You know, this little passage gives us a helpful definition of repentance, and it's one I've used here often at Gateway, and I'll use it over and over again because it's biblical, but that's that repentance is turning to God. The Hebrew word here is shuv, shuv, and it, and it means to turn around. It's a change in orientation. The heart was set against God, it's set against his ways, it's unwilling to listen, it's unwilling to follow, and now the heart is set on God, it's set for his ways, it's willing to listen, it's willing to follow. Now, this is the shortest section of the book, but it sets the stage for everything else that Zechariah has to say because without repentance, God's word falls on deaf ears. We cannot hear or understand or appreciate God's words, even his most glorious promises for us, without a heart change. When I was a kid, I, I grew up in going to church. Um, I was confirmed in my church. They practiced confirmation. I was confirmed in my church, I think at 12 years old. I received my first Bible, still on a bookshelf in my house at home. I tried reading it a few times. You know, like any book, you just pick it up, you open the first pages and go. I couldn't get very far. I couldn't get very far. It did nothing for my heart. It didn't make sense. It's like, what, what am I doing? It seemed like I, this is a book, it's important, it's big, it's thick, it's famous. I should read it. And I just, I couldn't get anywhere with it. I hadn't repented. I hadn't really been converted. I was confirmed, but not converted. I hadn't had a heart change. I'm not sure why my church confirmed me. It wasn't wise. It wasn't biblical. But they did. I think that's actually pretty common, unfortunately. Some three years later, though, when I, I heard the good news that God saved sinners like me from the hell I deserved, I had a heart change. I suddenly desired God above all, and I, I wanted to listen. I, I wanted to follow. And, and that very night, I began reading the Gospel of John, and it meant something to me. It was significant. It moved me. And I've been encountering God in his word since that day. If God's word is dead to you, could it be that you've not repented? Could it be that you're not 
actually converted? Could it be that you still need a heart change because you've never had the heart change necessary to receive God's good promises to you? Jesus speaks of being born again. The reason why he speaks of being born again, I think, among many reasons, is because no one can be born naturally into Christ's people. Christ's people, his church, are those who've had the heart transplant of the Holy Spirit. Being born into a Christian family and going through the rituals of that upbringing do not set you in God's people. We need to be converted. We need to repent. Well, that brings us to the second part of Zechariah's book, and and with their heart in the right place, maybe they are in a position to hear it and understand it and respond to it. But I'm going to be honest, this is really cryptic stuff. Zechariah says, that God's word came to him in a series of eight visions that are interspersed with additional proclamations from God. These, these visions are strange. He sees a vision of a man standing with horses, a vision of horns and a craftsman, a vision of a man attempting to measure Jerusalem, a vision of the high priest Joshua being accused by Satan, a vision of a lampstand, a vision of a flying, almost swimming pool-sized scroll, A vision of a woman in a basket being carried off by other women who have wings like storks. And a vision of four chariots of horses. They are strange visions. And each of these visions could easily be a full sermon. And frankly, I would need a full sermon on each one of them to do them justice. I can't hope to do justice to any of them in a short time. But generally, these visions, as cryptic as they are, they point to the hope present for the Jews who return to Jerusalem and the greater hope that remains for those who are actually God's people. There's a, there's a tension in Zechariah's book, especially in this section, but, but really throughout it. And I'm going to say more about that as we go here. But this can be seen, this tension can be seen Let's take these two sort of horse visions that flank the section at the beginning and the end, the first and and the eighth of these visions. The first vision of a, a man among horses is used to promise that despite a long exile in a foreign land, uh, namely Babylon, despite the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem, God still cared for that place. And so in verse 16 of chapter 1, We read, therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts. And the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities shall again overflow with prosperity. And the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. And then, At the start of chapter 6, which is, so this is a very long section. At the start of chapter 6, there's a vision of chariots going out across the earth as sort of ambassadors of God's presence. And and we see in in chapter 6, verse 8, Then he cried to me, Behold, those who go toward the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. Now that sounds weird and and maybe insignificant at first. The kind of thing where you read that and just like, okay. Weird stuff's happening, God. I don't understand it, but I'm reading it because it's on my Bible plan. But what God is saying is that it's, it's not just Israel that's at rest in peace, but now that faraway nation of Babylon, maybe, maybe Persia, but probably Babylon, a land of violence and enmity against God's people would be at peace. You say, well, I kind of student geography, Chris. Babylon's to the, to the east, not to the north. Yeah, but you don't go to Babylon to the east. We've kind of talked about that before, but there's this giant desert. Nobody went to Babylon going east from Jerusalem. You went, is remember uh, elementary school geography, the Fertile Crescent, right? You kind of had to travel a crescent line because otherwise you went through a desert and people don't survive well in those things. 
And so oftentimes Assyria, Babylon, Persia, those areas were considered northern countries because the way you got to them is by going out of Israel to the north and then heading over and across. But anyhow, so we have God's presence resting on Babylon. Violence and enmity, awful, evil things. In fact, Babylon becomes kind of the, the symbol of wickedness in, in the Bible. So that by the time... Uh, the book of Revelation is written, Babylon is kind of the center of everything that's set up against God, symbolically. And, and so, but the, in that place, God's spirit is at rest and there's peace. And it feels like something bigger and greater than possibly could have been going on in Zechariah's day. And we know from historical records it wasn't happening in Zechariah's day. It's a promise that the whole world would be at rest in fact, in, in chapter 1, God promises that he'll build his temple in Jerusalem. But by the end of the chapter, or by the end of chapter 6, there's this strange prophecy that's acted out by Zechariah, and he places a crown on the head of the high priest Joshua. And God speaks of a time when a figure called the branch arises. And the branch represents both the role of the priest, who's the intermediary between God and man, and the king who rules God's people. And this branch will also build a temple, which is strange because God has already said Zechariah is going to, or excuse me, Zerubbabel, was going to finish building the temple in Zechariah's day. But so there's this new temple, this different temple is going to be built. Sometime in the future, those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. So there's this, promise of something greater than the Jewish temple. The nations are coming from far away to build this new temple. And so you see this, this is indicative of this kind of tension in this whole section between things that are happening now and, and that they need to hear to be encouraged to do the work that God has for them, while all the while kind of setting their sights on something bigger and more distant in the future. In between these, these two visions of horses, God moves between this future reality and the present situation. On one hand, in, in chapter 2, God promises a Jerusalem so majestic that it can't be measured at a future time when the nations of the world will be worshipers of Yahweh and become his people. On the other hand, in chapter 3, God purifies the high priest, Joshua, from his time in Babylon so that he can serve faithfully in the temple that's being built. Something extravagant and beyond their time and something very important in their immediate context. In chapter 4, God promises Zerubbabel that by his spirit, the temple will absolutely be rebuilt. But then in chapter 5, a vision of a flying scroll seems to envision a time when the wickedness of the whole world is judged. And the end of chapter 5 pictures the wickedness of God's people being removed far from her. And just like Joshua, the priest needed to be purified, so God's people needed to be purified. God's people are constantly in need of being purified. And God symbolically has their sin removed and taken to Babylon, the sinful land, where it will find a home far from his people. And yet there seems to be something final about this removal of sin from God's people in that vision like something that's still waiting a future fulfillment. This section resonates with us Christians because we should understand that we face a tension between who God has called us to be and what God has called us to do, even while we recognize that there is a greater hope and a greater promise that lies in the distant future. Shameless plug for our uh, Sunday school course we've been talking about neighboring, about what it means to love our neighbors as ourself, as individuals, and as a church. And one of the distinctions we've made is between what's important and what's ultimate. Um, you want the full thing? You come to Sunday school. But we, we Christians have a bad way of conflating what's ultimate with what's important. Either we make everything important, and then in that way, almost nothing is important. 
or we throw everything, that only what's most ultimate matters and everything else is insignificant. We don't have these kind of shades of importance. So the way that looks sometimes for Christians is everything is about preaching the gospel. And if we're not preaching the gospel, it's unimportant. Or, on the, the flip side of that is preaching the gospel is just as important as everything else. And so as long as we stay busy doing good stuff, it's good. But we understand that there is a tension. Or we should understand that there is a tension between the fact that we are called to live in this world, we're called to live in communities, called to live in neighborhoods, and so we should seek the good of our neighbors. We should seek the good of our coworkers, even in practical, um, material ways, salt of the earth type ways, because we love people and they're made in God's image, and it matters that they flourish and that they are successful even while we still maintain that the ultimate way that we can show them love is to point them to the eternal things that cannot be taken from them, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We kind of need to hold both of these things. We know that this world is going to be utterly remodeled when God's presence comes. And some people say completely destroyed. I think if you read the book of Revelation carefully and closely, it's almost like a renewal of heaven and earth and heaven and earth becoming one new thing. But there is a major construction project that's going to happen throughout the cosmos. We can agree on that. And so our temptation might be, none of this matters then, right? It doesn't matter. We can if, if, I, if I litter or if, if my neighbor is, is unhappy with me, if my street is ugly, if uh, I'm rude to the guy in traffic, if I don't care about this coworker because he's really annoyed and by 5 o'clock I don't have to deal with her anymore, it doesn't matter because this world is fading away anyway. Or we can recognize that, yes, but God put us here for his good purposes, that there are things of this world that will endure into the next world. That's something that God speaks about cryptically in several places. But, and, and so what we do here matters, that we, we have an obligation to love our neighbors, to care for them, to be good to them, to be friends, whether it's our classmates or our physical neighbors, or our co-workers, even while we hold out the hope that ultimately we will see them find something that lasts eternally. We live in this tension between what God has already put us here to do and yet what we know we're going to be. One doesn't completely obviate the other. We need to kind of work on both gears. And I think that passages like like this section of Zechariah, these... um, Six, mostly, most of six chapters here in Zechariah help us to remember that God's people have always kind of been living in this tension between knowing that something bigger and greater is coming in God's purposes, and yet that doesn't mean that what's happening now doesn't matter. The third section um, of Zechariah's message, and it kind of is a bridge section, it spans two chapters in seven and eight, and it begins with a question. It says, in the fourth year, beginning of uh, chapter 7, in the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, which is Kislev. Now the people of Bethel had sent Sharezer and Regamelech and their men to entreat the favor of the Lord, saying to the priest of the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets, should I weep and abstain in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? And as the, as the passage kind of unravels, they mention a few other months as well when they seem to be having some fasts and some times of weeping. And what it seems to be that's going on, I don't know why my nose is so itchy this morning. Um, what seems to be happening in this passage is these, these uh, times of fasting seem to correspond with times of, of destruction on Jerusalem and, and Judah. Um, maybe the Assyrian conquest of Samaria and, and Nebuchadnezzar's ransacking of uh, Jerusalem in 586. And so they're memorializing these tragedies with times of fasting 
and weeping and mourning. And what's interesting is that they don't get an answer to this question directly, at least not for quite a while. God accuses them, actually, of whether they fast or whether they eat, they're doing it for themselves rather than for God. And that becomes an opportunity for God to address the people's deeper issues. We talked about this a little bit last week in, in Haggai, and, and I think it's, it's relevant here in Zechariah from a slightly different angle, that it is very possible to do the things that we perceive of as religious devotion to honor ourselves rather than honor God. They were mourning the destruction of their homeland and their people, but were they mourning, in this case, God's judgment on their sin, or were they mourning and fasting for their personal loss and their personal tragedy? It seems like it was more of the latter. So even while they sanctified it, they made it seem like it was something religious and holy, it was really about themselves and their own losses and their own difficulties. And we think we have a tendency to do this. What, think about your religious practices, your religious devotion, the things that you do as part of your service to God or to Christ. I'm willing to bet that if you are lax in anything, you are lax in the areas that you don't like as much. Right? And that's an indictment on myself as much as, as it is to any one of you. If, if you feel like you're called to X, Y, and Z by God, but Z you really don't enjoy doing, you probably do X and Y. But then you have to start thinking about it. Are, is your engagement in X and Y more reflective of who you are or who God is? If we worship and serve God only when it lines up with what my heart already wants to do, then is that saying something about God or is that saying something about me? And, and so we have to be very careful because we can do all of the outwardly correct things and still get it wrong because we do it for selfish reasons. You can even give money to the church selfishly. We tend to think of like giving money, that's like, that is the most selfless thing, right? You just, we take money out of our pocket and now I don't have it anymore. So that's selfless, right? But if we're doing it because it makes us feel good, that I'm a giver. I, and I know some other people aren't as good at givers as I am. But I'm very generous. I give quite a bit. I give very consistently. I set a schedule. I set it up with my bank account so that it automatically goes out the day after I get my check. What, whatever it is you do, if you're patting yourself on your back, even about something as basic as giving, you're perverting the giving. You've made the giving about yourself rather than about God. And what credit is that to you? Some of you may have been brought up in very, very strict church uh, families where you know, everybody gives 10%. It's calculated down to the penny, and you do it. And so now you still do that, but you do it. It's out of a, um, a habit that has been ingrained in you. And if you miss a day, if you're late in a day and writing that check, you feel overwhelmed with guilt. Well, then, is that giving about you, or is it about God? Is it about how it makes you feel, or is it about how it makes God feel? So God takes this opportunity of what seems to be some false religious activity, some, some devotion that doesn't seem to actually be about him, and he turns their attention to what are the deeper issues. So if you, you, you move down to uh, verse... 9 of, of chapter 7, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. 
Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. And let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. So what God challenges them with is, is, is the kind of the sins of the heart, the condition of their heart, rather than their behavior. Because if you know anything about ancient Near Eastern weeping and mourning and fasting, it very well may have been a very loud and we would probably think obnoxious affair. It's not like you did this morning and nobody knew you were mourning. You were mourning. Jesus, uh, we, you might be familiar that Jesus says when you do your fasting, you do it in a way uh, that doesn't reveal to everybody that you're fasting. Why? Because he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees would make a big show about their fasting. Oh, woe is me. I'm so hungry. Oh, why are you so hungry? Do you have breakfast? No, I'm fasting. Yeah, I've been fasting for two or three days. Yeah, I'm just praying about something at work. Yeah, I just got this job opportunity and just figured I'd fast about it. You know, um, you know we, it becomes about ourselves. It becomes a performance, right? And, and God says, look at the things that aren't performance, the things that people don't see. How you, how you treat that widow, how you treat that orphan, how you treat that person when no one else is watching, when no one else is looking at you. Because heartfelt religion has to come before performative religion. God does not say that there is no part of our religion that we don't perform. There are things that we do. There are things that we have to do in front of other people. That's true. Okay? But heartfelt religion has to come first. If it doesn't start here, then what comes out here will have no consequence. It has no value. And so there is a challenge to what kind of religious fervor these people have. Heartfelt religion must come before performative religion. Nevertheless, though, God promises in this section, you get this theme, I'm going to restore this city. I'm going to restore this temple. So he's going to do it. But this is how he's going to do it. And he finally comes around to answering the question. He says, your fasts should turn into feasts. Your fasts should turn into feasts. You know, and I think that could actually be a kind of an interesting challenge for some of us because fasting seems like really, really spiritual, but feasting doesn't seem really, really spiritual. So he's taking that away. But here's, here's the bigger idea. God says, I am going to undo the sorrows of those people who turn to me. I'm going to undo the sorrows. What do we read in the book of Revelation? He will wipe every tear from their eyes. God is going to undo the sorrows of this world. He is going to strip away the need for fasting and mourning and weeping and wailing because he is going to replace it with causes for joy. Come here, Zach, next week and celebration and excitement in the things that God is up to. Sometimes as Christians, I think we miss that. And, and sometimes we, we mourn the evil that's happened to us rather than we celebrate God's faithfulness. And I'm not saying there's no reason for mourning. Uh, blessed are those who mourn, Jesus instructs us. And we are to weep with those who weep. We're instructed in the New Testament as well. But do we spend more time mourning all of the evil that's come upon us? Woe is me. My life is hard. Or do we celebrate God's faithfulness? Celebrate the good things he's done in us and the promises that he has made to us? And do we allow our performative religion to overshadow our heartfelt religion? Do we allow ourselves to skate by 
on what people see in us externally, never being concerned with what's going on between here and our Creator. Well, that takes us to the, the last section of, of, of Zechariah's letter, uh, letter, his book of prophecies, um, in, in 9 through the end. And this is probably the most difficult section of Zechariah. It goes back and forth between poetry and prose, but it also goes back and forth between what seems to be hopeful and what seems to be ominous. Chapter 9 begins by describing God judging nations that have been historical nemeses for Israel. And this seems like the type of material we've read in some of the other prophets. You think about Nahum and Obadiah. But then in verse 7... God promises, I will take away its blood, talking about uh, an, an evil nation, I will take away its blood from its mouth and its abominations from between its teeth. It too shall become a remnant for our God. It shall be like a clan in Judah. And Ekron shall be like the Jebusites. Jebusites were a, a people that kind of got merged and married into Israel. God promises the purified people from among these nations that he's going to judge will become a part of his people. And then that gives rise to a, a coming king. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And there's this, this coming king when these nations are transformed into being part of God's people. And when that happens, this king arises who rules the entire earth with peace and justice. Words that we heard Sarah read this morning become applied to Jesus. That Jesus is this chosen king. We see that there are prophecies then in this section about corrupt leaders, which is striking because I think we're, we're starting to get this feeling, oh, God is turning his attention back on Judah. He's turning his attention back on Jerusalem. Things are getting better. Things are getting good. And then he slams these corrupt leaders and promises to strengthen his people. He says that attacks are going to come against his people, but they will prevail. And so there's this kind of this mixed sense in this section of, on one hand, things seem like they're about to get good, and then things seem to become a little bit uncertain. And this kind of culminates at the end of chapter 12, where we see this uh, spirit of grace and these pleas of mercy. It says, I, I will... Uh, in, in, Verse 10 of chapter 12, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy <clears throat> when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. And this, so this interesting figure arises who at one hand is sent by God and on the other hand is God. God is, is saying that they are going to look on me, the one whom they have pierced. And somehow this is connected to a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. And it's, and it's, it's really enigmatic. It's, it's really, you know, you can imagine Zechariah's audience, original audience, thinking to themselves, what does this mean, Zechariah? Like, how, how, is, how is it that God is going to pour out mercy and grace on the, by, by the way of the one that they have pierced, and the one they've pierced is you, God. How? And the end result of that. In chapter 13, it says, On that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. And then 
as Zechariah moves on, there's this sort of climactic battle. He, he foretells painful times for his people. But ultimately, God is victorious. And so in verse 9 of chapter 14, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. And on that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. And then he gives this dynamic picture of as Jerusalem as this place of healing with the nations coming to it and taking root in it. And the, and, and the nations and the faithful people of God are joined as one new people. And, and all of them are holy. There's, there's no longer a, a priestly class and, and just sacred objects for the temple. But, but even the common people and the common things are all holy to God from the least to the greatest. And, and again, we're, we can imagine that they're being left wondering, how is this going to happen? But for those of us on this side of the cross, we have an idea of how this happens. God is bringing all these things to fulfillment. There's a, there's a question for the Jewish people there in 520 B.C. Does God love us? Does God still recognize us as his people? And the answer that kind of comes through the book is yes and no. God will have his people and he will be king over all the earth. But who are his people? Well, his people are those who flock to him in faithfulness. Whether that comes from Judah or not, there will be those in Judah that are. But there's also going to be Canaanites. There's going to be Philistines. There's going to be Babylonians. There's going to be Assyrians. There's going to be Persians. There's going to be Edomites. There's going to be uh, Arameans. All of these people of the world sharing one thing in common, not language, not cultural identity, not skin color, but a love of the one whom they pierced. How is it that God can, can send this one and be this one? Well, we know that, that God took on flesh in Jesus, didn't he? And, and in the person of Jesus, God showed us what it was like to be man. He revealed to us how we can live without sin, without rebellion against God. Because that is the condition of all of us. We have our uncleanness and our wickedness that we desperately need taken away to Babylon. But Jesus didn't. And because he didn't, when he, was die when he died, see the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That means that I deserve to die because of my rebellion against God. But Jesus, who was without sin, deserved no such death. So when he died when he was pierced for our transgressions. You see, it wasn't for my, or for his transgressions, it was for my transgressions. It wasn't for his transgressions, it was for our transgressions if we are those who come to him in faith. Those who come to him, those who look on the one they have pierced and mourn for him, on them a fountain is poured out that cleanses from sin and uncleanness. Jesus rose again from the dead. He was seated at the right hand of the Father where he will come to judge the living and the, jet, living and the dead. And now he reigns from heaven as king of over all. And what Zechariah promises is his final coming where even the flesh and blood on this earth will have to recognize him as king over all the earth. To follow Jesus, to be a Christian, sometimes we talk about entering the kingdom. That means that there is a king and Jesus is that king. If we are connected to the king, 
then we are the king's servants. We are the kingdom's citizens. And we will enjoy this blessing that God promises to pour out. God will have his people and he will be king over all the earth. But the question that Zechariah's audience had to answer and that we have to answer is, are we God's people? It wasn't a matter of birthright. If you read the Old Testament, it never was. It was always a matter of who would join themselves to the one rightful king. Yahweh, who was God over all, who became flesh in the person of Jesus. We who worship Jesus have been united with the king. Those who come to the king are God's people. And so Zechariah's audience was going to have to wrestle with that. How they fared in this season. They had things to do in front of them. And they had promises that they could see forthcoming. But where, how they fared in those things all depended on whether truly they flocked to the king. Will you? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we um, thank you that you are moving heaven and earth, quite literally, all of history, in the palm of your hand, to bring about the good future that you have promised. Father, may we enter it. May we be known as your people. Not because we perform the right religious acts and devotion, but because our hearts have been converted that we've repented and we've looked upon the one whom we've pierced, that we have mourned that his life was shed for us and we have had our mourning turned to celebration. And Father, we pray for those who maybe are living lives of performative religion whose hearts have never been changed or transformed. And for those, Father, who have never heard this message before today, that they would Love the King. It's in his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>